Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the priests and the special days. That's Leviticus chapters 21 through 25. In our outline of Leviticus, we notice we started off with rituals where we had the laws of the offering. We already saw laws of priests uh, in chapters 8 through 10, laws of purity in chapters 11 through 15, day of atonement, more laws of purity, although we call that laws of holiness, more laws of priests, and that's what we're going to be looking at now, and then rituals uh, in the appointed times, uh, chapters 23 tw through 25. And there'll be a section right at the end of that on, on penalties and vows. What we're looking at right now is laws of priests. And notice we've already had laws of priests in chapters 8 through 10. When we saw those laws of priests, it was what the priests were to do. This time we're going to be looking at how the priests are supposed to live. Leviticus chapters 21 verse 1 Then the Lord said to Moses Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron and say to them, No one shall defile himself or a dead person among his people except for his relatives who are nearest him his mother and his father and his son and his daughter and his brothers also for his virgin sister who is near to him because she has had no husband for her he may defile himself. What that means is if that person dies or you have to take care of them in some way, shape or form it's okay but for extended relatives, for extended family, let some other member of the family do that. You're not to defile yourself. You're not to go from being clean to unclean. That's, we're not talking about a sinful thing. We're talking about cleanliness versus uncleanliness. Verse 5, they shall not make any baldness on their heads, nor shave off the, the edges of their beards. These are things you would do in mourning. Nor make any cuts on their flesh. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they present the offerings by fire to the Lord, the food of their God, so they shall be holy. That is, even if in times of mourning and stress, you're still to remain, you're sort of on duty at all times, and you're to remain clean, that you can be able to do those offerings. So Leviticus chapter 21, we have the qualifications of the priests. In Leviticus 22, we have the sacrificial duties of the priests. In 21, uh, they're not to have contact with the dead. There are no physical blemishes. They're to have wives that are virgins. And their actions are to be set apart. They're to be holy. In chapter 22, they're to remain clean. They're to eat of the sacrifice. And they're to observe these sacrificial regulations. Chapter 22, verse 31, we have a summary statement. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. That's a sort of a refrain we've seen uh, all throughout. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be sanctified. Remember, that's the same idea of holiness. I will be set apart. I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Now, Next we come from laws of the priests to appointed times, the rituals dealing with the appointed times. And we start off here, chapter 23, verse 1, The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. This is the Sabbath day, a holy convocation you shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. So the basic underlying principle of holy days starts off with the Sabbath, the, uh, the Shabbat, which was a day of rest. You were to make a Shabbaton, a complete rest on the Sabbath. Next we have seven observed times throughout the year. The first is the Passover. Notice that the first four of these all take place in the spring, although Pentecost is sort of late spring. You're almost in the summer by then, but I'm going to group it in, as part of the spring feast. And then in the fall, I'm going to have three, the trumpets, atonement, and booths. They will take place in the fall. So Passover commemorates the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt. The first Passover is remembered how God had passed over uh, the homes of those who had blood applied to the doorposts and the lintel. That would kick off the week of unleavened bread, which was a, symbolically, they would take all the leaven from their house, uh, remove from their bread from their house, and it was a reminder of the removal of the impurities of that old Egypt life, and they're not living there anymore. The first day of the week, once Passover had passed, would be the day, the feast of the first fruits. And now, 
this, this is right at the beginning of the harvest. Now, their harvest is in the springtime, not in the fall. It's at the end of the rainy season. And so the first fruits would be brought forward and offered to the Lord. And this was a promise of the rest of the harvest. It is a promise of the new life to come. It's, it's no accident that Jesus was raised from the dead on the Feast of the First Fruits because his resurrection is a promise of new life to come. You would then count 50 days to Pentecost and that came to eventually uh, be a time where they would remember the giving of the covenant, the giving of the law. But in New Testament times, it's to remember the giving of the internal law, the law written in men's hearts, that is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now those are the four spring feasts. Now we wait until the time of the fall, and that's kicked off by trumpets, which would eventually become the civil new year. Now that's not going to happen until they go to Babylon, because in Babylon, um, the, the new year takes place in the fall, and so the Jewish people would eventually adopt that. You never actually read of that happening in the Bible. That's not a biblical sort of thing. But what is biblical is at the beginning of the fall feast, you would sound trumpets. And then later on that same month, you would have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, as an atonement was made for the nation. We've already looked at that when we looked at the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. And then later on that same month, you would have the Feast of Booths, where they would for a week camp out in tents in temporary dwellings and it would remember they would remember how God was dwelling with his people how he had tabernacled with them he had tented with them when they were in the wilderness now just to put this in mind of an entire year now this is quite a lot on on our on our calendar on our chart here uh, t months 1 through 12 and they correspond roughly to March through February. No, you know, it's, it's not exactly because the moon doesn't go exactly in, in nice uh, lunar cycles. Instead, there's a sort of there's a 29, 29 point change uh, days to each each month. And so every once in a while, you have to just to get the calendar right, you have to throw in an extra month. Um, they would call that the intercalary month. Notice I've set up the the seasonal portions of these uh, of these months how you had the dry season in the summer months by about uh, April or May the the rain would stop and now it would be dry all the way until about September maybe uh, maybe October and that would kick off the rainy season and so I have the dry season and the rainy season uh, that right at the end of the rainy season we have the Passover and those other feasts the feast of first fruits and the the Feast of um, Unleavened Bread. I wait 50 days, and that's going to take me into the dry season, um, the Feast of Pentecost. Now, notice on the 9th of Av, in the fifth month, what we call July, early August, they celebrated the, the 9th of Av was the fall of the temple. Well, that's not going to happen until 586 B.C. So in Leviticus, that hadn't happened yet. That's not one of those uh, feasts that was observed. What is observed is in the in Tishri, uh, in the at the end of the dry season, we have Yom Kippur and the Feast of Booths. Those are observed. Later on, we're going to have Hanukkah, but that won't be observed until after the close of the Old Testament and in that in-between times between the Old Testament and the New Testament, some events are going to take place um, that will that will be memorialized and that will be continued to be remembered in the Feast of Hanukkah, uh, and that's in the rainy season around December. And then right at the end of the year, Purim, those are remembering events that took place in the book of Esther. So just wanted to give you the whole calendar, um, but that's not all given here in Leviticus because all those things hadn't even happened yet, so they couldn't be yet remembered. Next, I want to t uh, just go back over and look at the spring feast. The spring feast then were Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits. We've already talked about what those signify. Uh, think about this. Jesus is our Passover. And because of him, we've been cleansed. We remove the, the negative influences from our life. And he is our first fruit. He rose from the dead, and we're going to rise as well. And those are all com commemorated in those spring feasts. Uh, there's also Pentecost. And, of course, at Pentecost, remember, that's when the Holy Spirit showed up uh, in Acts chapter 2. Leviticus 23, 5 then, we have the setting forth of these. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. That term Passover 
<coughs> was was that time when the angel of death had passed over the the houses in which the blood had been applied. Then on the fifteenth day of the month, <coughs> there is the feast of the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Where there for the entire week they are removing leaven from their homes. They will have done this earlier, and they'll they'll remain without leaven without causing bread to be influenced, which makes it rise. Um, and they'll do that for an entire week. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you enter the land which I'm going to give you, and reap the harvest, remember that's in the springtime that takes place, at the end of the rainy season, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the, to the priest. He shall wave the feast before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. So the day after the Sabbath, Sabbath is what we would call Saturday, on the first day of the week after that, that's what we call Sunday, that's when the Feast of First Fruits, and of course Jesus rose on the first day of the week. He rose after the Sabbath, and he is our first fruit who has come before the Lord. Leviticus 23.12, Now on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male, male lamb, one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall, be, uh, shall then be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed, to the Lord, uh, or mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma with its drink offering, a fourth of an end of wine. So there was, there was an elaborate ritual. Uh, notice grain and wine. Can I say it this way? Bread and wine. Gee. Reminds me of something that we do as Christians when we remember what Christ has done on our behalf as our first fruit. And so this was a, a grain offering and a drink offering. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the grain offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. So 50 days later, that takes us to Pentecost, Pentecost just means 50, 50 days later. And with those 50 days, you, after that, you're to come before the Lord with a new grain offering to the Lord. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a, a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They're to be holy to the priest, or holy to the Lord for the priest. When you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field. Now, notice this is a reminder. This is being repeated. And the question comes, why is this command, this is a repetition of an earlier command. Why is it repeated here? Because we're talking about grain offerings. We're talking about those things. Just, just in case you forgot, you're to leave them for the needy and the alien. And remember at Pentecost, that's when suddenly the doors were open, not just for Jewish people, but in Acts chapter 2, they began to hear the word proclaimed in all sorts of other languages besides Hebrew. And it was indicative of what was to come, that Christ was going to send his apostles out, his people out, his disciples out, to make nations, to make disciples of all the nations, not just the Jewish people. You would leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Next we come to the fall feast. The fall feast, as we said, are the feast of trumpets, where there's a blowing of trumpets, the day of atonement, and finally the feast of booths. So here we have the, the first of the fall feast. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Present an offering by fire to the Lord. That, that's to, to cut, kick off what will be the next two fall feasts. Uh, and this is the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, blowing trumpets is understood. When you blow something, that's what you blow. You blow a trumpet. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On exactly the tenth of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall present your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You shall not do any work on this day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. If there's any person who will not humble himself on this day, he shall be cut off from his people. That is, it was a day when you recognized your sinfulness. Now, while the priest was doing that with the, the bulls and the goats 
in the tabernacle, the people were personally involved in going through a time of personal reflection. Verse 30, as for any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. This was a most holy day. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth of the seventh month is the feast of booths for seven days to the Lord. Now, this feast of booths, the way you say that is Hag Hasukoth. Uh, Hag is a, a festival or a feast. Sukoth is a booth, a, a, I guess it could be a tent. It's a temporary dwelling. Sometimes we translate this the Feast of Tabernacles. And that, that works too. Because a tabernacle, a tent, a booth, it's a temporary dwelling for seven days to the Lord. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work of any kind. For, the, for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It, it is an assembly. You shall do no laborious work. Now on the first day you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall re rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So they're to take the palm branches and wave them before the Lord, and you shall live in these booths. You're going to make booths for, for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. They didn't have regular houses. They had, I guess we could call them, mobile homes. And they were mobile homes that actually went places. So for a week, you're to live in booths. And you're to live in these temporary dwellings. To remind you of where you came from. And there's also a sense to remind you that this body in which you live right now is rather temporary. It's a temporary booth. Next, in Leviticus 24, I have regulations regarding the lamp and the table, regulations regarding the times at which the lamp and the table of the presence are to be in service within the tabernacle. And then there is, in chapter 24, verses 10 through 23, a situation where a man curses God in an altercation, and he's put to death, and there's other laws regarding altercations that are given as a result of that as well. Leviticus 25 then moves from we already went through the Sabbath day and then the feasts, the various feasts throughout the year. Now I have the sabbatical year where once a year all work was to stop. Or uh, I'm sorry, once every seven years. And then once you've gone through seven cycles of seven sabbatical years, you're to have the year of Jubilee. That is the 50th year is to be a special year, a year of trumpets, a year of celebration. So here we have uh, the sabbatical year, Leviticus 25, verse 1. The Lord then spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Your harvest after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrained vine you shall not gather. The land gets a rest. Just like you got a rest, the land gets a rest. The land shall have a sabbatical year, which means the year before, you have to save up for that. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves. Seven times seven years. That's 49, if you can't do the math. So that you have a time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely, namely 49 years. And you shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you'll, you shall sound a horn all throughout your land because this kicks off something new. You're to sound the shofar, the horn, and the sounding of the horn signifies that something new has started. You shall thus consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land of to all its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee. Now that's jubal, the same word as is used of a person's name in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 21. A jubal was a trumpet. And this is the year that's marked out. It starts by blowing the trumpet. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his own family. So if you're a slave, you're set free. If you've sold some land, it reverts back to you. You never lose the land. That word, 
Dubel also describes a ram's horn in Exodus chapter 19, verse 13. So it's the sounding of the, of the trumpet. And you shall have the fiftieth year as a jubilee. You shall not sow, nor reap its aftergrowth, nor gather in from its entry and vines. For it is a jubilee. It will be holy to you. You shall eat its crops out of the field. But if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh, seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops? Then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the crops for three years. I'm going to provide for you so much that you can go that seventh year and the jubilee year and the year after that because you haven't done any planting. <laughs> I'll provide enough for all those years for you. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently. For the land is mine. You can't sell the land. You're just renting here. You, Yes, it's your inheritance, but it's really my land. For you are but aliens and sojourners with me. Thus, for every piece of your property, you are to provide for the redemption of the land. You didn't really sell it. You only rented it out for an extended period. Because you can't sell it because it's mine. We have a land. We have an inheritance in Christ. And it belongs to him. Indeed, we are the inheritance of his.